Hello everyone, this is Roberto Valenzuela, my Canon Explorer of Light. Uh, so you bought a Canon EOS R5 or a Canon EOS R6. You're probably wondering like, what is the best way to set this thing up? Remember that cameras come out of the box for general purposes. The people that, the people that program the cameras in Japan, they don't know if you are a birder, a football player photographer, a wedding photographer, a portrait, a boudoir, they don't know who you are. So they just make these general settings that, that they think just kind of works in general. However, the, the cameras have to be customized to you, so it can become an extension of your arm and of your, and of your vision, and it doesn't get in the way. They're, these things are made to be customized for you and for your particular genre of photography. So, when you go buy a car at a dealership and you sit down and for, when you, you sign the lease, they rip you off and then you, sign, you get in the car, and then um, you're, the first thing you do is you put the seat forward, back, depending on the length of your legs, you adjust the mirror, you, you get your radio stations, your presets, you get everything customized to you. You cannot drive if the seat's all the way back and you can't reach the pedal. Same thing with the camera, you buy the camera, you cannot just use it. You have to actually, you know, zoom it in, like narrow the camera to your specific needs and wants, otherwise you're gonna be like, what am I gonna do? And this is a disaster. And one of the funny things I noticed is when people buy the super expensive, oh, 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 cameras, uh, amazing cameras, um, You uh, a lot of people sometimes don't take the time to customize it. So they call me up and they're like, hey, I want to be able to do this, but this camera doesn't do it, so I'm mad. And I'm like, actually, it does do it. You just have to learn how. So there's a lot of things these cameras can do that a lot of the things that are a source of frustration for a lot of people are actually nothing more than a menu item that you can change. So I thought it would be good to take care of this and uh, show you how I set up the camera for my needs. Now, of course, I am not an NFL photographer. I am not an Olympics photographer. I shoot portraits. I shoot commercial fashion. I shoot weddings. I shoot people. I shoot people. I, shoot, I photograph people in normal in events or as for portraiture or for um, commercial fashion purposes, magazines and that kind of thing. So this video will be very helpful to you if you're in that world. If you're in the portrait world, wedding world, or you want to shoot fashion or anything like that, beauty, this will work. If you are not in that world, this will still, this will still be very helpful, but it's not going to be as helpful as, as if you were in the other genres. Um, another thing I want to say is, this is my opinion, and this is not the way, this is not the rule of law, it's just me sharing how I customize the camera, that I have spent a long time customizing these things to make it really flawless and just seamless for me. So it's my opinion, you can take it or leave it, it's up to you. I hope this, the intention of this video is purely to help you and guide you in what some of these camera settings do. Let's get started with it. So um, here's, I have the Canon EOS R5 with the 35 millimeter lens, the RF35. I, I chose this lens for this video just because it's small and you can see the camera better. Uh, if I use the bigger lens, it's just too bulky. So I want to be able to just, you know, control the camera this way better. Let's start out with the fact that the cameras come, all Canon cameras come with these kind of icons, okay? You have the camera icon, the autofocus icon, the play, the wireless icon, and then some of the, some of the settings and the custom settings and some of these different things you can do and of course you have your star menu which is the menu that you can customize to, to exactly what you want to show in that menu kind of like a quick uh, best of best of all menus that you can use if you need quick access to them let's start out with the first one um, i'm not going to go over every menu item i'm going to go over the things that i look at and, uh, and what i've changed and why okay the image quality in my camera stays pretty much in RAW. Um, I don't remember the last time I, I put this on just JPEG. Um, I could sometimes make one card be RAW and the next card be recording JPEGs, uh, but in most of my usage I put both cards to record a copy of each other on, on both in RAW. I don't use um, compressed RAW either, I just think if you're going to go with it, if you're going to go for RAW, which obviously you should, just go with RAW. I mean, it is, it, it, you know, you're, you buy the camera for its capability, so why would you want the compressed capability? So that's what I think. I just keep it in RAW there. So let's move on to the more interesting ones. Uh, let's move on to Dual Pixel RAW. Dual Pixel RAW is one of those that people usually have disabled. Um, I, I actually have it enabled for many of the shoes. Let me explain what I use it for. 
Dual Pixel RAW allows you to make corrections like background clarity and, and adjust the lighting in the face. And you can also do, uh, the most important part is if you actually happen to focus on somebody's eyebrow or you're like on the frame of the glasses or something, you're like, oh man, I missed the eyeball to the exact. If it's a very small distance that you're out of focus, when you're shooting with Dual Pixel RAW, you can actually, uh, on Canon's Digital Photo Professional, you can actually re, re, you can actually bring back the focus back to the eyeball, given that the distance is very small. That's a pretty amazing feature. So if you feel like you have a great portrait and you miss the focus by a little bit, you can fix it on, on with uh, Dual Pixel RAW. For that reason, if I'm shooting general things like people hanging out or, or like portrait of somebody just, you know, nothing that important, I have it disabled. But if I actually switch to a client that's like important, like they want to, they're going to be buying prints and they want to be, they're going to be buying things and I want to make sure that I really nail it. I, I enable it. Um, I think it's going to give you double the file size because it's actually re re almost recording two sets of pixels for each photo you take, but it's worth it to me, especially when you're already spending so much money on the memory cards. I mean, what's, what's, what's the difference, you know? Um, plus you're not going to run out of memory. I mean, if you have a big CFast Express card, you're going to be fine. So I think it's better to enable it and then you have that capability to switch it around and change the lighting in, in the face if you need to on camera or if you are um, if you miss the focus points or if you want to add clarity to the background and a, a lot of different cool things you can do with that. Another reason you might want to enable it is because there's this thing called DP RAW processing on the cameras now on, on the R5 and R6 and they allow you to actually do quite a bit of manipulation to the photograph without having to export it into like Lightroom or, or anything like that. So if you're giving photos to somebody immediately, okay, and you want them to look really awesome, you can actually do that by shooting in dual pixel raw. It allows you to have even more control of being able to process the, the raw file down to a JPEG or a Hive and send it over to them uh, for they can, so they can see the photos right away. So um, it depends. What the situation is, all, all these menus depend, but that's the way I use Dual Pixel RAW. So right now it's, um, it's disabled. Um, if you enable this, you're going to also have a little bit of problems with, a little, with some of the features. For example, if Dual Pixel RAW is, is enabled, you're not going to be able to use um, electronic shutter, for example. Electronic shutter will not work, okay? You, you'll have mechanical shutter available to you. You'll have first curtain. Uh, electronic shutter but you will not have full electronic shutter so uh, things like that the cool thing is the camera actually tells you we cannot use this feature because you have dual pixel raw enabled so you can actually it tells you now it, it used to not tell you, you you have to guess but now it tells you exactly what's causing the problem what's limiting your menu options um, cropping aspect ratio uh, this is one of those super big ones that I, I've experimented a lot with and I gotta say I used to leave it on full frame and I don't anymore I actually leave it on four thirds or four three okay this one there is there is uh, the reason why I go to, to, to four three is because a lot of times my clients uh, especially because I shoot um, if you're like in the portrait or in the wedding world which is what I do uh, you have people asking you, oh, I want to order some 8x10s or I want to get some 11x14s. And these numbers that are still out there in the stores, I don't know why it beats me. These are still numbers that don't match today's camera frames. Camera frames are not 8x10. They are 8x12. That's the ratio. It's, it's a much more rectangular version. But 8x10 and 11x14 and all these stupid sizes, they're actually more like a squarish ratio. So I, I don't get it. But um, for me to do that, if I actually put it on four thirds, Look what happens to the frame. It, it actually puts two lines. Let me turn. Let me show you. It actually puts. Um, so you see, it actually doesn't show you the full width, okay, of the of the of the, of the sensor's capturing. The sensor is still capturing the full width. See these little black areas? That's actually still recording an image, but it's only showing you the four thirds. So if you put, if you do your composition with people within this rectangle here, this 4-3 rectangle, you're able to compose better, okay? Uh, now, you can, if you want to, go to 4 thirds and then go to the info button. You can click on the info button right here, and you can say, actually, don't mask the areas that are not 4-3. Actually, show me and just do an, uh, just show me a line. So now look at this. So now you have this line that shows up. 
So if you want, if this is more comfortable for you, you can make your composition this way, okay? You can make your composition this way and then say, and, and just know that you're trying to stay within this vertical, this within these vertical lines, and you can uh, be sure that when you do an eight by 10 frame or photo, you're gonna have the perfect composition for that eight by 10 format. So that's why that's really cool. Um, for me, if I'm shooting like fa fashion shoots or anything like that, I actually take these lines out and I just use full frame. If I'm shooting portraits or anything where there's a possibility of people buying prints out of it, then I actually put the lines and, and I just kind of keep trying to keep everything within these lines. And, and don't worry, you're still recording the entire frame. So don't think for a second, oh, I'm, I'm cropping parts of the edges. You're not. When you if you have it on four thirds, if you import the photo into Capture One, Lightroom, or Adobe Camera Raw, whatever you use, you will still see the full width of the photograph, okay? So don't worry about cropping off. So in my case, um, I actually have, in, you know, in general, I have my camera on four thirds because I wanna make sure that I don't miss that eight by 10 that people always seem to buy ratio, okay? That's what I have. Moving on. Um, Moving on to the next one. Now, of course, guys, I may have to do this video in two different, um, two different videos, okay? Because this might be part one, and I might have to do part two, just because there's so much to explain. So uh, stay put in case I do part two. Uh, here's the other one. Let's go over this one real quick. This is called, this is camera two, okay? Camera two. Um, I'm not gonna mess with that. Exposure compensation, that's fine. Um, ISO speed settings. Uh, I do actually use this one. Uh, it's quite a bit uh, because I want to be able to limit things. So for example, in the in the outer range, if you ever put your camera on auto ISO, which I do for some things and I'll explain, uh, you can say that when you're in auto ISO, you want the minimum shutter speed. Like I put my minimum, at, I think it's like 400 or something. Okay, I put my maximum, so this is a 51,200. I put mine like a 6,400, uh, something like that. And why? It's because I don't want the ISO to go crazy when, when it's dark, you know, it's, when, it's, when it's darker. I just want it to stay within that realm. I'm gonna, if I'm in a dark area, I'm probably gonna use a fast prime lens anyway, something like this 35, which is a 1.8, or I might use the 28 to 70, which is a 2.0. So I don't need, I don't need this to go above 6,400. So I limit that, okay? Uh, let's see here. So that's out of range, minimum shutter speed and out of, yeah, so here's where you can set also your minimum shutter speed in out of, but let's move out of that one. Uh, let's, I don't know, I don't even do that one. Auto lighting optimizer and auto tone priority. For me, these things are just gonna be off. I don't want lighting to be applied to my photographs. Uh, it, it's this, this basically applies kind of lighting to all the highlights, um, whereas there's other parts of the menu, like when you do the, the processing on the on the camera, which I'll explain, actually just does the lighting uh, changes of the light in the face. It like looks for the face, and then it, it creates higher, more light in the face, almost like a virtual light source. Okay, but this one basically just throws tries to recover lighting or or tries to add lighting to um, to uh, to everything that's that, that needs it or whatever. Highlight tone priority. This one right here is basically to not have to not have to avoid having a lot of bright lights okay or anything that might burn your highlights so sometimes i can enable it uh, the problem with enabling this is that if you do highlight tone priority because you're trying to be more conscious if i have a, a i don't know like a wedding dress and the wedding dress is very white or you're photographing with someone with a white t-shirt or something and they're you're in very harsh light i might consider turning this on I usually don't, but I might consider it because it will protect the highlights um, and it will try. It will be more difficult to blow them out. Okay, I don't put this in enhanced ever, but I do. I might potentially put it on on uh, enabled. Okay. Um, the problem with if you turn this on is that your minimum ISO can no longer go to 100. So your minimum ISO will now be 200, and you know sometimes. I just don't wanna have 200, I wanna keep it, my ISO as low as possible, but you can't because you have this on, so. Something to think about. Uh, Inter-flicker, uh, anti-flicker, that's if you're in an office setting and you have flickering uh, lights. External speed light controls for the flash, so we'll just skip that for now. Okay, big one here, white balance. 
For my white balance, I, I switch as soon as I buy the camera and I'm ready to go, I switch straight to Kelvin. Why is that? Because now with the new firmware updates from Canon and the Canon EOS R5 and R6, and I'm sure some of the other ones too, uh, like the R and the RP, I don't know, but I know that you can, you can do that with, e with these, is that the lens control ring right here, the lens control ring that every RF lens has, can now be programmed to change and dial in your, your Kelvin temperature to the exact specifications that you want. So I leave this in Kelvin, that way I can actually switch and dial in my Kelvin temperature immediately. I don't have to go diving through menus and stuff like I used to. Now I can just like, if, if I'm at a place that's like an interior and I'm shooting and, and then I walk out into an exterior part and I have to shoot anything, you know, your white balance is going to change drastically and I wanna keep my white balance um, pretty much the same for this, every set of images that I take. Um, Auto white balance does a good job, except you know it, it will vary the white balance up and down a little bit, and then when you're trying to make them all look the same in post, it's just like you have to dial in each one and it's a mess. Um, so here, Kelvin temperature, if I'm inside and I'm using tungsten lights, I might be at 3000. If I walk outside and I wanna go to 6000 to get that daylight balance, I just do the ring. I switch the ring over and I can switch. Okay, so that's what I do. Um, goes to white balance, that's if you have a gray card, uh, white bracket and shift. I, this one is just stays in zero, uh, but I do use this quite a bit, uh, just for fun. If, if you're shooting and you're showing people the back of your screen and you, you know, this really won't affect your raw file, but if you're shooting in the back of your screen and you want to show people like the back, um, if you're shooting over grass, which, you know, you shouldn't unless you have some sort of white light, bouncing white light back at your subjects. But if you're not doing that, you're gonna have green lights because the sun will reflect on the green grass, will bounce the light back into your subjects and they're, they're filled with green light, which they look like Hulk. But if you do that, it is nice to turn this down to go opposite of the green and be able to sort of try to counter the effects of the green when you're looking at a photo in the back of your screen. Adobe RGB or sRGB, um, these things, I, I keep it in Adobe RGB in general. It doesn't really matter because the, the, this, this color space are just a tag on your EXIF data. So it, you're not going to actually have a, a, an sRGB color space when you capture. When the camera captures in RAW, it just captures in RAW. There's just like no color space. It's, if you have to put a color space to a RAW file, it would have to be like Photo RGB or something humongous like that. But then when you open the photos in Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever, uh, you wanna say, okay, this, this, this tag it to Adobe RGB color space. So it will compress the colors to Adobe RGB. And if you choose sRGB, it will compress the colors to an sRGB. I'm talking about JPEG photos, of course, okay? So if you're shooting in JPEG, any kind of JPEG format, this does actually matter. If you're shooting in RAW, it doesn't matter. But just to make things easy, not, not have to be thinking about it, just keep it in Adobe RGB because it would be such a shame if you shoot JPEG and you happen to need the JPEG file, if it was stacked with sRGB, you're gonna end up with a tiny little color space and then when you try to do edits or anything like that, you're gonna, it's gonna start banding and the photos are gonna start looking pretty terrible because it's working with very limited colors. So keep it in Adobe RGB. Um, picture style neutral, all these picture styles are just like kind of cool. Remember that none of these matters if you're shooting raw because raw doesn't care about landscape or fine detail or faithful, it doesn't care, okay? Raw doesn't, ignores all of this stuff. This is back, just this, this is just for the back of your screen or if you're shooting JPEG. So if you're shooting JPEG and you're giving people the files straight out of the camera in JPEG, then this will make a difference. I keep it in neutral because the sharpening is at zero. And if you print your photos, you sure as heck don't want the camera to apply a generic sharpening effect to, all, all, to the entire photo. That actually can ruin a print. So I keep my sharpening at zero or neutral and I leave it at that. I, I just don't switch it out of that. If you do fine detail, you can end up with a sharpening of four, which is gonna be like crazy sharp. And then when you try to, uh, if you're in JPEG, you're screwed because it's gonna look like crazy sharp. If you're in RAW, it doesn't really affect it. But, um, but you know, if, if you wanna look in the back of your screen, uh, you know, if you nail the focus anyway, I think you'll be fine. You don't need to extra sharpen it, you're, you're good. So I would just leave it in neutral, that's what I leave it at. However, I do use monochrome a lot. And the reason is, when you use monochrome, the, the photos look like they are taken in black and white. See, it looks black and white. Now, of course, because I'm shooting raw, the photo's not in black and white, the photo's in full color, but it looks in the back of your screen when you take a picture, it looks black and white. 
Why is that important? It's important because when you're photographing something with tricky lighting and you really want to nail the lighting down, you, you, can be, you can remove all color distractions because red, green, blue, all those crazy colors like of parks and cars and red cars and vehicles and all this stuff can actually distract your eyeball from what's actually happening. So I wouldn't do, uh, if you're having a tricky light, lighting situation, I actually just go to black and white. That way I can see and concentrate exactly on what the lighting is doing on my subjects. I not let my eyeball wander because there's some super bright you know, primary color somewhere in the back of the, of the frame. So uh, I do do that a lot, which is great. Now remember, if you're shooting in JPEG and you put this on monochrome, then your photo will forever be in black and white. All right, clarity. Clarity is a brand new item and it's just basically, um, I don't know why it's doing that. Let me just see if I can fix that. The screen is going crazy. Okay, there we go. Um, clarity, oh, there we don't go. Clarity is basically, Okay, let's move on to Clarity. Clarity is a brand new item. It's, um, it's nice. Uh, I don't use it, I just leave it at zero, but it basically creates a more sharper contrasty uh, feel to the image. So, you know, when you do the, uh, the, the processing in the camera from a raw file to a JPEG, which you can do, or a high file, you can actually change the clarity to just affect the background, which is kind of interesting. Uh, this is another one, lens aberration correction. This is a bit of a big one for me. Here's a big point of discussion and where people are going to completely disagree with me and that's totally cool, this is just my opinion. Um, I don't like lens imperfections whatsoever in my images. I like to get my photos as accurate and as beautiful as possible. And because I know how complicated these lenses are in terms of trying to make them as perfect as possible, they um, they, they all come with a few issues. Like it's it's you can't have a perfect lens, there's, no, there's just not, not such a thing. So in the edges, sometimes the photos might get darker and it creates like a vignette. That's why I have the peripheral illumination correction on. I don't, I don't want the edges or the corners of my photos to be darker. I want them to be just as bright as the middle. So that does help. Uh, distortion, why would you not want distortion correction on? Of course you do. You don't want to have a photo with where people, start, where people look distorted or there's a funny distortion. So. If you can fix it, why not? And now this doesn't fix it completely, but it's sure as hell. It's sure as hell a lot better than without it. This one, Digital Lens Optimizer, is a big one. So I have mine on, on high, and you're gonna be, if you know what this is, Digital Lens Optimizer, you're gonna be like, Roberto, you're absolutely crazy. Um, I don't always have it on high, but I do when the photo really matters to me. So if I'm shooting people just having fun, doing whatever, this is disabled. But if I'm shooting anything that really is important, like a portrait or something that has to be more refined, I for sure turn this on high. Here's the pros and the cons of Digital Lens Optimizer. The, the, the pros are it corrects for pretty much everything on the lens, okay? Everything that's, that's, a, that's a, an issue with the lens manufacturing, the way the light comes in, the diffraction, the color, the peripheral illumination, the sharpening from a high high apertures like f16, f22. If you're shooting landscapes and you have you don't want any diffraction in, in your in your photographs, digital lens optimizer is going to help you a lot. Be able to get everything sharp instead of having the light basically bounce around and not create a super sharp image. So uh, the cons. The cons uh, are of using digital lens optimizer on high is that it actually takes almost four times longer to record the photo to the memory card. However, you can still keep shooting. So the buffer is so big on these cameras that you can continue shooting and shooting even though it's taking forever to record to the card. It doesn't matter how fast, you can buy the fastest cards out there in the world, it will still take a long time to write to them because it's doing a lot of calculations trying to correct so many things on that, on that, that with that lens that it's taking a long time to process that and, and, and dump that information back into your memory card. Um, the biggest con with this is that 
Yes, you can keep shooting because the buffer allows you to continue shooting. So that's a good thing. It doesn't stop you from shooting. But the bad thing is that it does not allow you to, to play your photograph. So if you want to review the photos you just took, you have to wait till they write to the memory card. And then the play button shows up. So you're just like waiting and waiting and you're just like, oh my God. So if you're not looking at, the, at your camera a lot and you, you're not looking at the photos that you're taking, you're just shooting, then I think it's fine. I'm going to take this out of that so we can go back to color. Okay. So that's lens separation, that's lens uh, optimizer. I'm gonna disable it right now because that's going to affect uh, other things in the menu. So I'm gonna disable that right now so we don't have any problems. Um, but that's what digital lens optimizer does and I'm a fan of it, even though people think it's like, a, it, people think it, does, it, just, it just takes too long, uh, which it does, but you know. Uh, let's see what else, ISO speed, okay. All these noise reductions, I just turned them off. I. I don't want the camera applying an, a, a generic overall um, a generic overall noise reduction to the file. Okay, I would rather do that. Plus, I don't really shoot in really high ISOs anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But I just don't like the camera doing all this stuff for me. A lot of these things are probably better done in a raw processor anyway. So, all right. Uh, okay, here we go. Let's go to camera menu number six. So. The shutter mode, okay? The shutter mode in these cameras, you get three different kinds of shutters. You get mechanical, electronic first curtain, and electronic. So I already explained this on my first video that I did on the EOS R5 as soon as the camera came out. And, uh, but I'll just do a quick explanation of this. Mechanical is basically like your home base. It is the most stable shutter you can use on the cameras. They it, it will have the least amount of distortion. It will basically have the least problems. It's going to be great. It's just a solid mechanical shutter. Does it make a little bit more noise than the other two? Yes, it does. Uh, but it's so quiet anyway that to me it doesn't matter. Therefore, my camera stays on mechanical because I don't want to have any problems when I add when I add lights or flashes or anything like that. And if I'm shooting and it's this quiet, like you you can't even hear it. See how quiet it is? Okay, you can, I mean, it's very hard. No one's gonna be like, oh my gosh, what was that? Okay, no one's gonna see, no one's gonna say that. So, you're good. Um, electronic first curtain shutter. That, this is a great one because it basically is like the best of both worlds, kind of. Um, this one can introduce a little bit of uh, issues, but tiny, tiny, tiny. Uh, but the advantage of electronic first curtain shutter is that it brings your your flash sync speed all the way to 250th of a second from 200th of a second. So if you're on mechanical, your highest sync speed with a flash is 1 200, and if you're on electronic first curtain, your, your flash can go to 1 250th of a second. So it's a little bit of a boost. And if you, and in this situation, sometimes every little bit matters. It's not much, but every little bit matters. So I think if I do need to, uh, if I am shooting people that are moving, uh, you know, like they're walking, they're, they're not just standing there, okay? If they're walking or there's any kind of movement, then I might go to electronic first, uh, electronic first curtain shutter, and then I bring my sync speed all the way to the maximum of 250th of a second. Um, electronic shutter is going to be an awesome choice because it allows you to shoot in complete silence. Nobody will ever know you're taking a photo. Of course, that could be very disrespectful and inconsiderate of you if you don't let people know that you're, they're being photographed. Of course, that's up to you, but um, it, it, it shoots in complete silence. Let me show you. Oops, I didn't turn it on. Here. As you can see, those white lines show up because those, are, those lines are telling you we're taking pictures. But you, because it's completely silent, you don't hear it. The problem with electronic shutter is that if you're in electronic shutter, you cannot use flashes at all. So there is no speed lights. You, it's just for pure natural light. And the other thing is that it's cool because you can shoot up to 20 shots per second, okay, at the, at the full 45 megapixel resolution. So that is actually uh, pretty intense. If you're shooting with a Canon EOS R6, this will shoot, this will be at the full resolution of that sensor as well. So it is pretty, pretty remarkable actually. Uh, however, again, no flash. 
Okay, release shooter without card. Um, I don't want to be that guy that starts a shoot. You're all flustered. You're mentally distracted. There's all the, these people are asking you questions, and then you forget that you don't have a memory card on the camera yet, and you're shooting pictures. Uh, I know it says no card on camera when you're shooting, but it's just another thing that you have to look at the screen. Um, I have actually missed done this once. I've only done it once, but it was once was too much where I actually started shooting a job and I didn't see the screen, I was just too distracted and there was no memory card on the camera, so of course I caught that quickly, but that was bad. That was a bad situation. So because of that, um, the, the release shutter with a card just stays off. Okay, coming down to touch shutter on camera menu number seven. The touch shutter is always stays disabled. I dislike that so much. I don't like it when I'm, play, I'm doing things and then you accidentally touch the screen. Um, what touch shutter disable, what touch shutter does, it basically makes the screen, the back of the screen, the camera, not only into the way you focus, but it's also, it also releases the shutter. So um, if you touch the screen anywhere, it will focus where you touched it and then take a picture, okay? The reason why you would use the touch shutter and enable it. It's let's say you are on vacation or you're trying to take a portrait with your fiance or your wife or your family and and you you know somebody passes by and you're like hey man can you take a picture of me real quick? Can you take a picture of the family? They're like oh sure. When they give, when you give them a camera like this they're gonna be like what the heck am I doing? So it's easy for them to just say oh no don't don't just just enable this and then point and just say you don't even have to mess with the focusing or anything. You can just say um, of course, right now with, through HDMI, I cannot show you. But let's pretend this is the screen of the. Let's pretend this is the back of the camera. Okay, you can just tell that this is what the, the the person will see. Okay, the person you give the camera to will see this. All they would have to do is touch the eyeball of of one of you, or let, let's say, you know, whoever given the camera, just touch the eyeball, and it will focus on that person on that eye and it will take a picture. So you don't have to worry about it. They can see exactly what they're doing. You don't have to tell them where the shutter is. You don't have to do anything. Just say, when you see this, touch my eye or touch touch my eye on the screen. It will focus there and take a picture. So that is actually a great feature to have if you're, give, if you're gonna give the camera to someone else, okay? Um, image review. Okay, this is a big one for me. Of course you want your, your review to show up in the back of your screen. I don't know why you would turn that off. Um, I do turn that off when I am training myself. So if I'm doing an exercise to see if I can estimate what the lighting will look like, okay? If I can estimate it. For example, um, sometimes I do exercises where I use my strobes and I do a light meter and I check the lights of all the, of, of all the all, I check all the meter readings of, of the lights that I have. And based on those numbers, I try to calculate in my head what the photo will look like. And so I take a picture and then I take another photo with another calculation and, and I don't let the camera show me what the results are. I want to be able to just see it uh, in my mind, okay? So sometimes I turn this off for training purposes because if it's on and as soon as you take the photo or whatever, you're going to go back to the screen and you're going to be like, okay, there it is. I, I, I want to concentrate on the lighting without having the answer on my camera. I wanna be able to just take the test without having to rely on the camera um, to give me the, without the camera giving me the answer right away. Um, so that's when I would turn it off. Otherwise it stays in two seconds, but this is the big one for me. Viewfinder review is huge. It, and it's always enabled in my camera, again, enabled, because here's why. When you're photographing someone, okay, um, it's, it's so cool to be able to take their picture, okay, like you're, you're shooting, you're like pam, 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 and you can actually see the, the photo you took in the viewfinder, which means you never have to separate your eye from the camera, and thus, when you are posing the people, when you're, post, when you're posing them, the energy of the pose will not be altered. So, like, the energy of the photo shoot will not change because you're still going, like, all right, guys, that's good. Let's do that. Keep doing what you're doing. This looks beautiful. I love this. Oh, that's amazing. Keep it up. That's amazing. Keep it up. Do that. And even though you're actually not, you're actually making corrections based on the photo that you're seeing. And then once you see the correction, you can tell them without taking the camera out of your face and then disrupting the moment. And you're like, hey, can you put that hand back on the left? 
Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. And then you continue. By the time you do that, you already ruined the photo shoot, okay? Like people, when people are vulnerable that they're being photographed, they don't want to be like laughing and stuff and having a good time with their people. And then they realize you were not even taking pictures, okay? That pisses people off. So, you know, in a way to be able to make corrections, okay, on the lighting or on the pose, okay, is to be able to keep, keep, keep the momentum going by not removing the camera away from your face, but you can still see the photo in the viewfinder. Imagine you are the subject and you're trying to be like playful and vulnerable in front of this photographer and you're trying to like do whatever. And then the photographer wasn't even looking. He was chimping. He was looking at the back of the, he was like, oh yeah, that doesn't look good. And you were like, dude, are you serious? I thought we were taking pictures. Doesn't, doesn't go well. So just believe me, um, image, image review on the viewfinder stays enabled, it will keep the momentum going when you're doing shoots, you'll be able to make changes uh, li like live, like on the wire, like while you're shooting, because you can actually not only take photos, but review the photo in the, in the viewfinder without ever removing the face, your face out of the camera. Okay. Um, okay, exposure simulation. Uh, this is a good one. Um, if you're shooting in natural light, you want to you want the exposure to be to be to be expressed in the in the screen or in the viewfinder. So yes, you want that enabled. Okay. Um, the problem is when you're shooting like in the studio. So if you're shooting in a studio environment like I am here, and you're shooting like at studio settings, which are like ISO 100, f16, or f8, um, shutter speed 200 of a second. When you do that, you're gonna have a black screen. In, in, because it's it's basically saying at those settings you have nothing but black because the lights haven't fired right so the lights that, that your strobes are going to be illuminating your subjects not not the, the light not the sensor or the natural light it's just purely the strobes so if you have this enabled you're going to see nothing if you're in a studio environment with studio settings and you won't be able to to you won't be able to do what you need to do. You, you want to be able to see what you're doing. You want to be able to let the focusing work. So it's, it's better to, to turn that to disabled, okay? It's better to just turn it to disabled. And I think uh, if you're in a studio, I, I disable it. And then what happens is no matter what your settings are, it will stay bright. For example, let me show you. I'm going to disable it now, okay? Here, that's what this settings, that this is what it looks like right there. And I'm, I'm at ISO 800, as you can see on the screen. Now I'm going to change my, my ISO to 100, so I'm going to make it darker basically. Look, I'm all the way at 100 ISO, and as you can see on the screen, it didn't change. Okay, it's still there. Okay, then I'm going to go to ISO, I'm at ISO 16,000, and it didn't change. It stayed the same. So that's why uh, when the lights fire, the strobes fire, those lights will illuminate the, the, the situation. But that's actually kind of cool. Now, let me go back to ISO 800. Okay, now check this out. Go to menu and go to enable. Now, if I go to ISO 100, you can see that it darkens. Okay, and if you go to some crazy aperture like, like F22, it's complete darkness. So you cannot see that way. So, um, that's the difference between those, between those, okay? All right, let me switch this to ISO 800. Okay, great. All right, moving on. This during exposure is just another option that you, you can actually have the simulation just during the exposure. It, it's an option, um, I just ignore it. I just go to disable or enable. If I'm in natural light or I'm shooting outside, enable. If I'm shooting in the studio and uh, the the main the, the light is the main light is coming from my studio strobes, uh, I disable the exposure simulation. Okay, uh, here's another one: uh, viewfinder display performance and display performance. So, actually, don't want to talk about that one. I want to talk about this one: display performance. Uh, I have mine on power saving, and here's why. This display performance, basically, when you're looking at the electronic viewfinder, this takes, the one that's called smooth, 
just takes more, it ref the refresh rate is a lot higher and it looks almost like you're looking through a mirror, like an SLR, it's very, very smooth. And that's great, but power saving saves a lot of battery and you can still move and you can still, it doesn't affect your photos at all. And you can still see 98% uh, as good as you could in smooth, except you get a lot of battery savings. So to me, it doesn't make sense to put it on smooth. Uh, unless you're super anal about your experience being almost like an SLR, but to take a look at this. This is smooth. Okay. See, it, like the people's heads, like when, as, as, if I move quickly, it doesn't actually affect, it, it looks, it's instantaneous. When I put it on power saving, look at this. See the little, see, it has a jittery, see? People shake a little bit and it, it, it just doesn't have the refresh rate. Uh, it, it's not as good of a refresh rate. But look, you can still see, like, here is that person, here is this person. So to me, if, if I can save battery, why not? If you have a thousand batteries and you don't care, that's great. Even if you do, I would hate to have to go like, oh man, my battery's out and you have to go switch it. So this is an opportunity for you to save a little bit of battery. So I have mine on power saving. Okay, let's move on to autofocus.